The story of how the MiG-23 turned into the MiG-27 is incredibly straightforward and very complicated at the same time. It's hardly a secret that at some point, the MiG-23 was both a plane riddled with problems and a major breakthrough, as the decision to use the variable geometry wings introduced a lot of technical difficulties, but also allowed the jet fighter to perform extremely well. A MiG-23 with a full combat load had a takeoff speed of around 250 kph, and it could go over Mach 2 if the wings were set to fully swept. That's pretty impressive even by the standards of the 21st century. And that's precisely why the MiG-23 is still in service in several countries around the world, despite its age. When it comes to the MiG-27, though, things get considerably more complicated. If we want to make sense of it at all, we have to go all the way back to the age of piston engine aircraft. During World War II, the air forces of the Soviet Red Army heavily invested into strike aircraft, armored warplanes specializing in close air support. As you probably know, it turned out to be the right call. It's no coincidence that the legendary Il-2 became both the best ground attacker of the period and the single most produced military aircraft design in aviation history. A few years later, the Il-10, which was a direct descendant of the iconic Sturmovik, proved its worth during the Korean War. In fact, it performed so well that in the early 1950s, the Soviets started producing it once again with just some minor improvements. With all that success, it's kind of logical to assume that Soviet ground attack aircraft had a bright future in front of them. The Soviets simply had to design a similar aircraft, just with the jet engine, right? Well, the task wasn't quite that simple. There were a few attempts, sure, but they never made it past the prototype stage, and the decision makers of the Soviet Air Force were so enthralled with all the possibilities that supersonic aircraft held, that they kind of forgot about the strike aircraft. Indeed, Soon, all major powers of the world had lots of speedy interceptors, but the market for affordable strike aircraft with good survivability was almost non-existent. And when you tried to make a proper ground attack aircraft out of expensive jets like the F-4 or the F-105, you got something that wasn't entirely there. As it turned out, no one was entirely sure of what a jet-powered strike aircraft should be like. That's why when Soviet decision-makers concluded that their Air Force needed a new plane of this type to replace outdated variations of the MiG-15, MiG-19 and the Su-7, the Mikoyan Gurevich Design Bureau had to work with a design assignment that was pretty vaguely worded. And their solution was to simply make a multi-role aircraft with ground attack capabilities. Was it the right call? No one can be sure, but it did make the military happy. So there was that. Initially, the team responsible for the project planned to just modify the MiG-23 to make it into a fighter bomber with some extra capabilities. But soon it became clear that due to the sheer scope of changes, it wasn't just a variation of the MiG-23, but a new plane. Accordingly, even though the first aircraft of the series was still called MiG-23B, the brand new ground attack aircraft was accepted into service as MiG-27. First of all, the new warplane received a different undercarriage, giving the aircraft a minimal ground angle. The team responsible for the project also removed the nose-mounted radar system and gave the plane a revised nose in the fashion of many strike-oriented aircraft of the second half of the 20th century, as on the Jaguar, for example. 
The warplane could still carry short-range air-to-air missiles with IR seekers, but in addition to that, it received a lot of new tools allowing it to engage ground targets. Guided missiles, rockets, gun pods with cannons, fuel air explosive bombs, hmm, you name it. This jet could carry four tons of weapons and still go supersonic. In the early 1970s, that was pretty much unheard of. Moreover, when it came to hardware, the MiG-27 was almost perfectly compatible with all variations of the MiG-23, including the MiG-23 MLD, which was introduced into active duty in 1984. These planes were pretty similar on the technical level, but performed different roles in combat, and the fact that the Soviets could deploy and use them in tandem not only allowed for a greater combat flexibility, but also significantly reduced operational costs. The variable sweep wing also provided both the MiG-23 and the MiG-27 with good low-speed maneuverability, making it easier for them to conduct precision airstrikes. All in all, on paper, that was one hell of a ground attack aircraft. In real life, though, things were considerably more complicated. The real MiG-27 suffered from the same problems as its predecessor. But now they were even more obvious. The aircraft was intended to fly at low altitudes, but operating at low altitudes isn't exactly the turbojet's strongest suit. The MiG-27 also didn't have much to show in terms of survivability, which is very important as ground attack aircraft are routinely targeted by basically every type of enemy they encounter in active duty. Not to mention that, at the time, the armies of potential adversaries were already getting their hands on mass-produced anti-aircraft missile systems, including portable ones. In the end, no matter which way you look at it, you'd probably get better results with just a conventional strike aircraft. A subsonic one, yes, but with lots of armor and greater survivability. Despite all that, the MiG-27 was definitely not an outright failure. On the contrary, in the end, it became one of the most successful cases of a supersonic fighter jet converted for ground attack roles. It also jump-started the revival of the Russian strike-oriented aircraft. And this time, it might be here to stay. <laughs>